European climate law fit for purpose? That's the question. And that's good news for all you lawyers out there. The law is back, not only in, within uh, the Energy Law Forum, but also the topic itself, the European climate law is back on the agenda. It's a, gre uh, it's a key feature of the European Green Deal, evidently. And it also comes at a time when the predecessor of the Green Deal, the Clean Energy Package, rather looked a little bit soft in terms of the governance with uh, EU-wide targets only and based on member states' uh, plans. And some people were asking themselves whether full decarbonization can actually be reached and be handled with tools which are somewhere between what has been agreed in the Paris Agreement, so in a UN context and a project management textbook. And evidently the European Union would not be the European Union if somebody would not try to recalibrate the allocation of competences between the institutions and between the European Union and the member states. And that's probably not surprising that in the context of the discussion of the European climate law, the commission was duly accused of power grab and uh, we are in the middle of a discussion of several hot governance topics. I would say the gloves are off. Sovereignty, which was long hidden bashfully in the term and this in, or came under the disguise and was discussed only in the term of the energy mix in, art, in the Lisbon Treaty, um, is now being discussed openly. And these uh, governance topics that are included in the European climate law um, were discussed not only between the institutions and not only within the institutions, but also publicly uh, already for the last couple of weeks. And we're very happy that we do have this amazing lineup today to continue and take forward that discussion. Only a few um, topics that we will be hearing today about. It's uh, whether decarbonization um, should be achieved only on the level of the European Union or per member state whether the commission should have the power by way of delegated acts to set trajectories also after 2030, whether we need an expert-based um, advisory body in the European Union, some type of an EU IPCC, uh, or whether the institutional setup as we have it now is sufficient and many others more. So the discussion is open. Ambition and governance, are they good enough to get us from here to decarbonization? And I would briefly like to introduce the speakers on today's webinar. We have uh, first with us Luca De Carli, he's head of unit at DG Klima at the European Commission in charge of legal matters. So nobody would be better placed uh, than Luca to start our discussion here today. Then we have Jürgen Schneider, who once in his career was the chairman of the Energy Community um, Environmental Task Force, but has moved on and is now the Director General at the Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology in Austria, here in Vienna. Um, we have then also Niels Meyer Ohlendorf uh, from the Ecologic Institute, a senior fellow and head of the International and European Governance Program. And finally, last not least, we have Simone Borghesi, um, who is director at the um, EUI and FSR for climate, um, and also a professor of economics at the University of Siena. Uh, now, I do believe uh, that indeed, we have all the ingredients to make this discussion inspiring, lively and interesting for all of us. And with that, I would hand over to my partner, Lee Henscher, who will take us through today's discussions. Thanks a lot and enjoy. Thank you very much indeed, Dirk. Um, and nice to see also Janis there behind you. <laughs> Give him a wave. Um, <laughs> so um, 
from my part, um, on behalf of the Florence School of Regulation, we'd like to, to welcome everyone to, to the second um, of these panels um, in the, the Vienna Forum. Um, and today, indeed, uh, we have the very uh, topical and uh, ambitious subject matter um, on climate change and the climate change law, um, or sorry, the climate law, I should say, um, is it fit for purpose? And we thought perhaps uh, to invite Luca just to give us a quick um, rundown of where we are um, as the, the, the drafts are now um, going through the legislative process. Um, so where are we? And is there perhaps hope that uh, by the end of the German presidency, we will have a text? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, and thank you very much, dear, for the invitation and the introduction. It's always difficult to be the first one to speak after lunch, and so I already thank Dirk for being so provocative about our previous proposals <laughs> and, uh, and the current one. So you certainly got my attention. Uh, I'll try to tell you a bit what we are trying to do with the climate law and uh, in general climate in, in this commission. You remember that uh, when uh, President Botelayan was elected, she was elected on the basis of a policy platform where I think there are three or three and a half key climate proposals. One is to put the objective of climate neutrality for 2050 into legislation. And this is what we have tried to do with the climate law. The second is to increase ambition for 2030. You know that our current 2030 target is uh, emission reduction of at least 40%, and we brought it to at least 55. And also this, we brought it then legally under the climate law proposal. Number three, then we, she also wants to increase our engagement with stakeholders and society at large with the creation of a climate pact, a new platform that we will launch next month. And the half proposal, just because it's not uh, DG Klima dealing with it, but certainly we are involved, as we increase climate ambition in Europe, we certainly need to increase our international outreach and our international diplomacy on climate. But it's also clear that increasing ambition in Europe also increases the risk of carbon leakage, of seeing production delocalized or replaced by imports uh, from third countries. And so we are also working to a proposal for a border carbon adjustment mechanism. Back to the climate law. Why are we proposing a climate law? After all, the European Council has already agreed the objective of climate neutrality by, by 2050. The parliament has endorsed it in a two or three or several other resolutions. What is the value added of putting it into legislation? One, it's, we think it's politically important. It uh, shows that uh, we take this matter seriously to the point of binding ourselves to it. Two, I think it has a even more important uh, economic objective. Now we know that climate neutrality is possible. It's not that uh, we have most of the technology, we know how to do it. The key question is deploying the investment to deploy this new technology and bring it uh, into, into production. And on a lot of uh, these projects, whether it is steel making or infrastructure or gas pipelines, these are very, very long-term investments. Uh, between now and 2050, there will only be one or two investment cycles at best. And so we thought that from us as regulator to give a clear sign of where we want to be and where we will be in 2050, we can better guide in a strategic way these investment decisions over the coming decades. On top, of course, of having the 2030 targets, we will have 2040 targets, but if we already know where we want to be in 30 years, uh, investors and the economic sector will manage to plan and better uh, uh, prepare the investment which is needed towards this. So this is a bit the economic policy of the climate law. The climate law, okay, law is a funny word for the European Union. Everybody was saying, okay, what is a law? And the EU law, it is a regulation. And so you can imagine every time we talk about it, the legal service does not let me say the climate law, but I have to say the climate law regulation the commission proposal for a regulation on the European climate law. Uh, it's a very short text. What we have in mind is a bit of, again, a tool that we don't have in our legal order, but some form of framework act. We're not regulating everything about climate change in the climate law. What we want to do is to put, I think, this superstructure, these objectives and a minimum of governance framework, but of course, this works together with all the other individual pieces of legislation sector by sector. 
And so the first thing to put in the climate law is targets. Target number one, we want to be climate neutral by 2050. How do we define this? This is an EU-wide target. And Dirk was talking about objectives at member states level. This will also come. But when we talk about 2050 and climate neutrality, we made the conscious choice of saying this is an objective for the union overall. Of course, all member states and all institutions have to contribute to this objective, but we don't divide and say, this is the part of Germany, this is the part of Luxembourg, this is the part of Bulgaria. It's all together that we will be climate neutral. Second is an economy-wide target. All sectors of the economy has to contribute to it, no sectors excluded. Third is a domestic target. We want this emission reduction and this increase of removals to happen on the EU territory. Of course, we value very much international cooperation. Of course, we still negotiate Paris Agreement mechanism for carbon markets and credits. These are great, but they will be on top of this definition. It seems to us that if the objective finally is that the entire world comes to climate neutrality, there's not much point in us coming to climate neutrality from an accounting perspective a little bit earlier. If we all we are doing, we are using the effort of, of someone else. And number four, it's a net target. So like the Paris Agreement, we define climate neutrality as a balance between emission and removals. But of course, uh, cutting emissions is much, much more important than increasing removals. But it seems to us that there will be some emissions even in 2050, even with old technology, that will be very, very hard to eliminate. Animals <laughs> is the first one that comes to, to mind from farming. Again, electric planes, I'm not sure we would ever have a technology which is light enough to make a big plane flying on batteries. So there will be some emissions that uh, we will not manage to, to cancel. And that's why we also want to increase the capacity starting from the, from, uh, the, the land and the nature sector to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is the 2050 target. And then in September, we also added a 2030 target, this target of at least 55. Again, the four uh, qualities of the target for 2050 apply also for 2030. So we say we want as a union overall to be at least at 55%. Again, in the climate law, we, not, we don't divide this from the member states. And then we will have now a discussion on how we will implement the 55. It's economy-wide, all sectors. It's domestic again. We don't foresee to use international credits to achieve 55. And it's a net target as well. So now this was a little bit more controversial, the climate neutrality, because the target we had before was perceived or was said to be an emission reduction target. Instead, uh, this gets a little bit complicated. The way we regulate climate in the European Union is we have emission trading sector with power generation and uh, energy intensive industry. We have transport, we have buildings, these are under the uh, effort sharing regulation, and then we have the land sector. The land sector, as regulated already now, is both a source of, of emission, nitrates in the use of pesticides, animals uh, as a, uh, in, the, in the form of uh, animal farming as emissions, but of course, it's also a source of removal from our forest. Of course, if you cut a forest, you diminish your removal. If you plant a forest, you increase your removals. And already now we were balancing the land sector within itself so that the emissions and the removals were balanced, at least balanced. What happens is that the removals are a little bit more. What we want to do in uh, this 2030 target is to increase the capacity of the land sector to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. And so we put, uh, rather than balancing in itself, we would like that sector to contribute to absorb the emissions of also the other sectors. And so we define the target as net precisely to put more pressure on land to, to try to make it do more. So this is the framework of the targets, 2050 and 2030. Now the governance of these two targets split in two. The governance for 2050 remains under the climate law and the governance for 2030 remains under the clean energy package, which is a bit, I think is a little bit more than, uh, than project management, we have a regulation on the governance of the energy union. So I will tell you a bit how the two works. For 2030, every year, we make progress reports of where we are as a union and where the member states are in achieving this target. This is the state of the union report, state of the 
Energy Union report. Member states also have 10 years plan called the National Energy and Climate Plans, in which they tell us what they intend to do to achieve. We saw it in draft, we make recommendation in draft, we saw it in final, we make recommendations in final, and then they update it uh, every now and then with additional recommendation from the commission. The big threat to member states is not so much we commission make a recommendation, is that if we don't see enough progress at member state level, we can and will make proposals to bring a sector from national level to European level. And so have legislation that then will apply uh, to everyone in the same way. The governance for 2050 is on top of this. So while every year we will say this is how well we are doing or not towards the 2030 target, in the years of the global stock take of the Paris Agreement, which is every five years, all the parties come together and try to increase, say this is what we've done and this is what we can do to increase the level of ambition. We would then on top of assessing progress towards 2050, we will also, 30, we will also try to assess progress towards 2050. Of course, until 2030, this is already covered. And so in addition to that, we would say, and these policies that you're doing, if you look at them with a long-term perspective, you will see these additional considerations. You know, the classic example, if you switch from coal to gas, this might be very good for your 2030 objective, but fundamentally cannot remain the same policy that will bring you to 2050. You will need already to think about, okay, then after gas, what do I do? Because gas still has some emissions. And so that's what we try to do every five years. We will make recommendation uh, for the union. We will make new proposal. And we will also look at the long-term strategies and the policies of the member states and say this is the additional long-term perspective on top of every year us making the point of where we are on 2030. Other elements which we have in the climate law is a coherency function. Uh, already putting the objective into law clearly will have an implication on how we interpret the existing legislation and the new legislation that we will propose. We also take an explicit commitment to assess every new proposal from the Commission against this objective of climate neutrality and put this in the impact assessment. And then, of course, we will make it also clear how we've taken this objective into account in developing new proposals, including budgetary ones. Another element that we have in the climate law is uh, the legal basis of the climate pact that I mentioned before. We already have mechanism for interaction with stakeholders in the governance regulation, where we ask member states to have multi-level dialogues with all stakeholders in preparing the plans. We bring this also to our, on us as European institution and mostly as the commission as the executive to then also create a mechanism of engagement uh, on climate policy with the public. And this we will make a proposal uh, next month. There are a few amendments of the governance regulation. So the governance regulation, which is the framework for the 2030 target, the reports, the progress, already has in a few places some mentions of a long-term objective of the European Union or the long-term objective of the Paris Agreement. And so these small changes that we've done to governance is basically to acknowledge that now the long-term objective of the European Union is 2050 uh, climate neutrality. And so we go in, we change all the references to make them back a reference to the climate law. Now, trajectory, delegated act, power grab. In the commission proposal, it was always clear to us that the targets, 2030 target, 2040 target, will belong to the co-legislator, just as we proposed in September, that the co-legislators agree the 2030 target of 55. So we put this as a proposal in an article of the climate law that would need to be adopted by co-decision by council and parliament. In addition to that, I talked to you about this progress report, assessing progress towards 2050. How do we assess this progress? Of course, you can do it in a little bit in a qualitative way, like the example I told you about gas. Gas still has some emissions and therefore it's not possible to keep it on the way to 2050. We wanted to make it a little bit more precise. And that's why we came with this concept of trajectory, which basically was when we have the 2030 target, we arrive at zero in 2050. So we try to design a trajectory, but this was not meant to be 
the new target. This is meant to be a tool for the commission to guide its assessment of progress and give a little bit of uh, predictability also to this assessment of progress. Because we proposed it by delegated act, I think a lot of people did not understand it. You will not find this trajectory as it is in the parliament position on the climate law, nor in the council position on the climate law. So you ask me to say where we are on the process and, 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 and then I finish. So the parliament has voted its position on the climate law. Um, there are many ideas which were not in the original proposal. So first of all, 2050, they say very well objective for the union, but they also would like it to be each member state to have a 2050 objective as well of climate neutrality. 2030 target in our proposal is at least 55 in the parliament proposal is at least 60% reduction compared to 1990. The setting of future targets. Uh, I think here they try conceptualize to devise, to divide the two, air, the two functions of uh, this perceived trajectory. One is to say target setting and the other is guidance to the commission in making a progress report. Clearly they go for co-legislation for setting future targets and they provide more details of when the commission will have to make a proposal on the basis of which impact assessment and a bit more procedural details which track a bit what we've done for 2030. They still keep a trajectory for the assessment of progress, uh, but they would like it to be established by uh, co-decision. Both for targets and uh, for assessment of progress, in the parliament position, we should establish a carbon budget. While in the European Union, we regulate with the climate policy through emission reduction targets in the Parliament's point of view, we should have a carbon budget, so a quantitative limit total of emissions that we allow and then use this budget as a tool for regulating and therefore also as a tool for setting this trajectory. The Parliament has a few extra proposals which we did not address, they were mentioned before. So the budget, the creation of a scientific body to advise us, but also to monitor progress and also to make recommendations of where this body thinks that our policy does not go uh, fast enough. Um, they have something about coherence between the budget and the climate neutrality objective, the role of the taxonomy regulation on sustainable finance. Uh, they have something about access to justice uh, for citizens and NGOs, especially at national level. And yeah, many other different amendments uh, that, uh, that were not covered, but okay, we'll be dealt with uh, one by one. On the council side, so at the Environment Council last month in Luxembourg, they've agreed a partial general approach. Why partial? Because they did not, they took a position on everything except a couple of paragraphs, and this is the level of the 2030 target. So council has a position on everything, but on 2030, we are still waiting for discussion at the European Council level next month, uh, 10 and 11 of December, where we expect the European Council also to, do, to give guidance on which uh, level uh, they would like to have for 2013. Then on that basis, uh, Parliament will have, Council will have a full position. At the same time, Council is ready to engage already. And I think we will start trialogues quite soon, already on the basis of the partial general approach. But of course, they will cannot discuss the issues for which they do, do not have a mandate. And this is the, the 2030 target. Okay, so this is for the climate law. Of course, we don't just create targets uh, for the fun of it. We create targets to so then implement them. How we will implement it? Now that we propose 55 as a headline target for the union, we have to revise all the different pieces of legislation. We will make proposal by June, 2021 to do several things. One, ETS, so power and uh, energy intensive industry. We have to increase the level of ambition if, because it's calibrated for 40%, we need to be recalibrated for 55. We would like to bring the maritime sector under ETS. For now, we only have a transparency regulation on emissions. We would like also to apply carbon pricing to these emissions. Uh, we will study the possibility of moving building sector and transport under ETS. For now, there are national targets for these sectors. Of course, there's also European legislation on the energy performance of buildings, CO2 standards for cars. This will remain, this will be increased, but perhaps we will consider then bringing market-based mechanism also in these two sectors. 
on the land I mentioned before. We want to reform the Luru CF regulation to increase the absorption capacity of the land. One technical issue then is if we move cars and uh, buildings from ESR to the ETS and we increase the land, there's not very much which is left to be covered by the effort sharing regulation. No, and so we're looking at many options. Should the effort sharing continue to apply on top of ETS? We have many regulations that already apply on top of each other. No, for example, if we bring cars under ETS, we will still continue to apply CO2 standards for cars, of course, and make it more stringent. Should we instead separate it and have a big uh, ETS, and then we make slightly bigger the land sector, we bring in the non-CO2 emissions from ag agriculture into a bigger LULUCF. Are there some hybrids approach? So this is what we are trying to reflect on, on top of energy taxation directive, border adjustment tax, energy efficiency and renewable energy, everything for a big, big package in, in June 2021. So okay. there we are. Oh, great. Thank you very much. I was just going to say um, thank you very much for a very um, extensive um, but uh, very, I think, uh, compact presentation of what's been going on. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of questions, but first of all, I'd like to move on to, to some comments uh, from the, the panel members. And I thought, let's go from law to economics and maybe um, ask Simone as... Um, the economist um, who um, quite pointedly said to us, don't ask me ask any legal questions, <laughs> um, <laughs> but wanted uh, to reflect um, uh, from, the, from his expertise as an economist working in climate um, for many years. And um, I think is uh, very much the authority here. So maybe um, how do you see the impact of this new approach um, especially some of the ideas that, that Luca was mentioning at, um, in the last part of his, his presentation there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lee, and thank you for having me uh, in this very interesting panel. Also, I'm not uh, from the law perspective, but uh, yes, I want to bring the economic perspective on this. And I, um, to answer your question, what can be the expected impact? Uh, I think uh, building up on what Luca was saying, we can expect a, an impact obviously on competitiveness because uh, prices will have to rise, uh, carbon prices, that's unavoidable. We already see them rising, but if we go for, as we should do, if we go for uh, climate neutrality, prices will keep rising. And this will obviously have a competitiveness effect that we have to take uh, into account. Just to give you some numbers, I play the economist part here. Uh, there are some interesting study, one is particularly from uh, Burke and others, who try to estimate the highest marginal abatement cost of reaching climate neutrality. In that case, it was for the UK, climate neutrality by 2050. And it turned out to be uh, to range between 135 and 225 euros, uh, depending on the sector you take into account from electricity to say aviation. And also other simulation studies uh, report similar numbers from 2000, 2050 or three, uh, uh, 300 and sorry, 250 or 350 euros by uh, 2050. Now, if we compare these numbers, with the current carbon prices, which is around 27 in the UTS, that this means that prices will have to rise by 10 times or more. So competitiveness effects, which have not been found in the literature in general so far in terms of carbon leakage, will probably uh, emerge. But we have measures that we can implement, and Luca was mentioning one of them, the carbon border adjustment, that would help us creating this level playing field. And if I can say my humble view on this, this is probably, you know, I have mixed feelings on this because I know the problems of retaliation that this can bring about. We need to work on cooperation with uh, the other uh, main partners at the international level to clarify how the system would work, not impose it, but probably it could work even better than the free allocation that we had in the UETS. 
so far that sometimes we know, especially at the beginning, uh, created some distortions. And so uh, in this sense, I believe that uh, we can um, correct this kind of distortions. Another possible instrument to, um, to, to compensate for competitiveness or better to prevent competitiveness is what we are working on uh, at, uh, at the Institute with my team, namely linking emission trading systems. Because in this way, we could make price converge across different uh, jurisdictions. And this is in the end the best, thing, the best way you can think of to prevent carbon leakage. Because if you pay the same everywhere, obviously there is no reason to delocalize any longer. And on the second point that I wanted to mention in terms of expected impact, one is on competitiveness, as I said, the other will be in distributional terms because there will be winners and losers. So we have to, uh, say that clearly, we know that in advance, but uh, well, think for instance of uh, poor households who generally spend a higher share of their budget into energy. So there will be some regressive effects, but this doesn't mean we cannot compensate them. We, we can think and apply compensation mechanism both within countries and across countries. and. Again, the revenues that are raised through the emission trading system can be an extremely powerful tool for this purpose. So one of the main instruments that we have at disposal is not the instrument that we should uh, work on. So always keep in mind that this kind of market-based mechanism uh, raise money. And so this is the powerful tool that we have to uh, compensate regressive effects that naturally occur because you know, it's just in textbook uh, analysis that we don't have a regressive effects. In real life, it's always a second burst or third burst word. And so we have to intervene to co um, correct the unavoidable distortion. Thank you very much. So if, if I can summarize as a, um, as a non-economist, you'd like to, you appreciate the market signals to make this transition, but they have not to be too harsh um, for those who might otherwise be left behind. Is that yes? Let's say that the, uh, I do appreciate market signals, not to be too harsh, and also not alone, because mm. market alone will not solve all our problems. It's not you know the silver bullet, but it's a powerful instrument that, together with other things, can lead us in the right direction of this ambitious uh, climate neutrality target. And again, if I may add just one more thing, uh, I appreciate when Luca was mentioning the need to keep other instruments as well. So he was mentioning the transport case. Uh, let's consider having transport under the EU ETS. I think that would be a, an interesting way of having all sectors building agriculture transport under the same instrument. But transports also create other kinds of uh, negative externalities. Okay, think of local pollutants. And so we need also standards to uh, address these other problems. So market-based instruments, certainly a very powerful instrument, but not alone. We have to uh, accompany them with other companion policies that has to, that have to be uh, addressed sector by sector and uh, country by country, if you want. So we cannot avoid the degree of complexity that uh, environmental problems uh, bring about. Thank you. I think that's, um, that last remark, country by country, uh, the degree of complexity um, brings me uh, to Jurgen um, from, uh, to ask him, well, you know, as a member state um, and one, I think, with, with, with um, green credentials and quite an ambitious, uh, green policy in comparison to everything's relative. Um, how, how, do you, how do you, uh, as from the, the viewpoint of a member state, look towards these ambitions that we've just been hearing about? Yeah, I will try to do that. First of all, just let me compliment the Vienna Forum on European Energy Law for having this very timely debate about the, about the climate law. Um, 
you can see that the discussion on the climate law is 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 taken very seriously on the on the member state um, on the member state level. I mean, you have to imagine the the when the new uh, Commission came into force by the end of last year with the European Green Deal, they announced that they would propose that climate law. Uh, the proposal was put forward by the Commission in March this year, and um, and we already have. Uh, and we already have two votings by the two legislative bodies. As, as Luca has pointed out, at the beginning of October, we had the voting in the European Parliament, which voted for quite some, well, I would say drastic amendments. And we've heard of, uh, about that, for instance, 2030, 60% reduction. We've heard about the carbon budget, uh, negative emissions after 2050, uh, and also achieving uh, climate neutrality on the member state level. But it's also remarkable that we, uh, what we achieved a partial uh, general approach in, in uh, on the 23rd of October. I mean, everyone is hit by the Corona crisis, and there was a discussion if we would hold, uh, if we would hold the um, Environmental Council um, as a as a physical meeting, and it was really. Uh, also, um, a, a strong wish by the German uh, Council Presidency, Svenja Schulze, who, who showed some leadership. Uh, and um, different, for instance, to the Energy Council, which was held only virtual, uh, that was held um, physical, and which meant uh, we had the quorum to, to achieve um, the partial general approach. It's also remarkable to say that um, there was a huge majority in, in, in favor of this general approach. Uh, it was in fact 26 member states at the end of a discussion which supported that it was one member state with an abstention. Um, so you can see there's this really huge interest. Um, why is this, why is so much interest? Because it's really, I, I think it's a landmark decision. It, it, it makes achieving, it makes achieving um, climate neutrality irreversible. I mean, we had the political um, decision on climate and climate neutrality already December last year by the European Council. But the European Council, as you all know, only gives the general guidelines for policy. Now it's really the Environment Council rule of law and, 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 and stick to that. But I think it's also a signal to the to the outside world. I mean, uh, Europe was uh, really on a front runner with uh, this climate neutrality in 2050. We've now seen that uh, there's um, uh, that Japan has joined that club. Uh, South Korea has joined, and and most remarkable, Xi Jinping at the at a general assembly in September this year announced that uh, China would go for climate neutrality in 2060. We have, as you all know, very interesting developments um, in the United States heading to COP26 next year, end of next year in, in, in Glasgow. And it's very important uh, that we also have a discussion not only in 2050 and that the show will take that serious, but also in 2030. So here we again have a very interesting distribution of work between the different council formation. Of course, the Environment Council is responsible for the climate law. Nevertheless, um, um, we had a long discussion. Well, there have been some discussions um, to, to have a 2030 discussion um, um, only at the Environment Council and beside that by qualified majority. But it came out very soon and very clear that such a fundamental political decision should be first taken by the, uh, by the European Council on the 10th and 11th of December. Uh, let's hope that there are not other issues and you know there are currently other issues discussed um, very controversially in Europe. Uh, let's hope that that, um, that that decision will be taken. It's also important for, uh, for planning reliability. It's a signal to the market and as, as one of the commission, uh, commission officer, uh, Mauro Petriccione pointed out at the, at the Environmental Council in October, really stepping up climate ambition from 40% to 55% uh, is really about, uh, it's, what, what's it about? It's about stepping up investments and, and pushing innovation. I mean, increasing climate climate ambition by this 15% per, uh, percent point means 100 billion additional investment in Europe. And what we want to, to, to make in particular in, in, in times of cor Corona crisis to build back 
it's better to build back stronger and we see climate policy as a huge market uh, market impulse for just job creation and 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 creating creating investments so where we are now we have uh, the partial general approach we we have the uh, we have what the parliament has decided so we are now preparing for the so-called trilogue uh, that means uh, commission parliament and and council presidency um, we start this process um, i would say rather slow why is that because we've heard that the 2030 decision has not been taken yet by the uh, by the uh, by the council and that's why we have this this general uh, general approach but we are of course uh, very supportive to that. Uh, we know as soon as we have included, uh, as soon as we have included 2030 also in the climate law, as Luca pointed out, that's not the end of the story. That's really the starting point. We have to get uh, all the legislation which we have, well, um, um, discussed and negotiated five years or so. We have to reopen it, have a close look at it, and see what um, 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 what has to be what has to be renewed. And we have heard about the ETS, where we have possibly the most interesting discussion of extending the scope, for instance, and 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 including buildings and and mobility. And I really have to emphasize also what Simon and Luca said: if we include additional sectors in the in the emission trading system, it's not instead of sectoral regulation, but it's in addition to sectoral regulation. We need energy, energy performance of buildings directive. We need CO2 standards for cars and light duty and also for heavy duty. We will also have a look at the effort sharing and see what's going to be left. There is now a discussion among member states about um, if we stick with effort sharing, how to distribute the efforts. In, in, in the current system, we are very much based on GDP per capita um, as a metric uh, to, um, to distribute the efforts among member states. We and others are convinced that cannot be the sole, uh, the sole criteria for a renewed effort sharing, in particular if, um, if we have a view to go to climate neutrality in, in, in 2050. There's also a lot of discussions among member states about the so-called enabling framework. That means whatever circumstances which allow all member states to make their contribution um, towards climate, uh, climate neutrality. It's of course about, about financing. Um, it's um, about support for, um, for the more poorer member states. And we expect some, uh, some interesting discussions. We had a non-paper, for instance, from our Polish colleagues um, talking about the ETS revenues, um, we had a non-paper from our from our colleagues um, from Hungary. Um, we have a non-paper distributed at the Environment Council from our Czech colleagues about the LULUCF sector. As more as we will bring down emissions from um, from fossil fuels, the more things will uh, will will become important. And we have heard also from Luca that the role of things has to be increased. First of all, natural things, but that sometimes we will also have to discuss about, about, about technical things. I think for the moment, I leave it with that. Uh, be assured that we have also in, 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 uh, for the coming European Council already very intensive discussion. It's very important decisions. And uh, well, um, it's, 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 it's a good thing to see, uh, even though all member states are hit hard by the Corona crisis, we still have a very informed and very good discussions about uh, further developing our, our law to combat climate change. Thank you very much. That um, was a very optimistic, well, I think an optimistic note that you ended on, cautiously optimistic, as we like to say in English, but uh, upbeat and uh, very interesting also to hear that 26 member states were on board. We won't ask uh, which one wasn't, uh, but maybe it was a non-paper person <laughs> or a member state? No. No? Oh, okay, right. <laughs> so um, maybe now it's uh, good to, to turn um, to, to Niels um, to give us his reactions from um, the, how is he, how do, does his organization see uh, matters proceeding? Do you think it is ambitious enough um, uh, that we, uh, are we on track for 2050? What, um, what is your take on uh, what you've heard? Thank you. 
thanks so much and thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I think Jürgen just made a very important point when you were saying that um, um, we are quite upbeat. I mean, if I look at what we have seen in 2009, um, after the um, financial crisis and what we are seeing now within in the midst of the corona crisis, it's quite remarkable that we are discussing um, 55, 60, um, 50 percent, etc. And we're discussing climate neutrality. So I think this is really an important um, aspect of the whole discussion that we're having a deep economic crisis. And yet Europe understands very well um, that we are obliged. I mean, there's simply no... I mean, I hate to say that, but I mean, I guess that's right. I mean, there's no alternative um, except to go to climate neutrality within fairly short periods of time. Um, so that is, I think, for me, it's an important point. It's also an important point, and I think it's a bit of a re reaction to what one of the speakers has said, that, um, I mean, the prices for renewables, I mean, we all know this. I mean, this is now the cheapest source of energy, um, and it's also the most reliable in a way. I mean, if you look, I mean, what we are seeing, I mean, the dependency on oil and gas from countries that we actually not the most stable ones. Um, so in that sense, I mean, I'm also sharing a, a sense of optimism. Um, I think it's 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 great. It also share that, I mean, and I was not surprised actually that, I mean, 27, 26 member states have um, signed up to this. I mean, this is something where we have, I think, much more unity in Europe than in other policy fields. And I think it's important to stress that, I mean, climate and energy policy is, in fact, an area we, where we work together, I mean, quite closely, despite all the controversy, of course. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is a contested area. It is bound to be contested because, I mean, so much is at stake. And yet it's not a divisive area like, I mean, like, for example, rule of law. So, um, and that is something, I mean, also makes me optimistic I and mean, I think what we are having on the table is a really um, it's a good proposal um, and what we are seeing um, from the other institutions I think there's really remarkable progress. Um, I would like to make maybe like four points um, um, concerning um, the different positions. I mean Luca outlined extremely well and I just I mean how how um, the different institutions are seeing um, the commission's proposal. Um, I don't want to focus on 2030 so much because, I mean, this is something that has been discussed, I mean, so much. And I mean, it's um, um, it maybe it's, too, it's dominating the discussion too much. I mean, of course, we know the next take, decade is crucial. We cannot solve the problem if we keep on with the same pace that we have I mean, the last decade. So this decade is really important. So, But yet I would like to make a few points um, on the governance structure that I consider to be very important. Um, one is um, the issue of net target and, and gross targets. I mean, Luca was making the point, I mean, we have a gross target now. And I think it's, that is for very good reasons um, because removals and reductions are inherently different. It's a very different thing whether you have um, a ton of carbon dioxide stored in oil, gas um, or coal in the ground or whether you have it stored, for example, in a tree. Um, or in other sink. So there's an inherent difference between reductions and removals. And to make this dif difference clear, I think we have to be very careful not to mix these two systems that we don't compare apple and oranges. So that is, I think, very important. I think for a robust climate system, it is, Im it is essential that we keep these two different things separate. Um, for the many reasons, also accounting. I mean, if you look at the accounting challenges for removals, they are so much greater than for reductions. So I think it's important that we maintain the current system. Um, this is one. I think the other proposal that's a bit um, disguised, and Luca was mentioning this very briefly, is um, the question of emission budgets. Um, Parliament has made, I think, a very um, clever um, and, um, yeah, adequate proposal when it was saying when we set the new 2040 target, when we look at the new trajectory, and when we look at what the mandate of the European Climate Council will be, it is always in a way based on emission budgets. And that is a very clever idea because climate is a cumulative problem. It's, it's not really what matters. It's not really what we do in a certain period of point in time, but what we do over time. So because greenhouse gases accumulate over time. So that is, so in a way, if you would ask me what is the most important figure in climate policies, I would say it's this, this year it's 413 ppm. And that is the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. 
So that is why I think the commission, uh, the parliament's proposal on emission budget, it's not, it's an emission budget, not a carbon budget. I think that's an important um, point to make. I mean, it's, a, it's not a carbon budget, it's an emission budget, is really something that is very worth being discussed. And I think it's, it's I think maybe the most fundamental and most important proposal um, in parliament's position. And it should be taken very seriously because of the reasons that climate policies is something that we have to do over time. It's not something we do in a specific moment in time. And it's also something very similar, I mean, something familiar for um, European climate policies because what we do actually, we have a climate budget, uh, emission budget, sorry. If we look at um, ETS, non-ETS, it amounts up to an emission budget, but it's very disguised. It's something for experts. And I think it would be a game changer if we make it much more transparent. Um, last point is um, on the, um, Luca mentioned this also, the um, independent advisory body. Um, we have this in many member states. Um, colleagues of mine have done a research on, you know, climate policy uh, government system member states. And if I'm not mistaken, it's in 17 um, member states that either have a um, um, council and uh, climate council or are planning to have one. So it's something very similar. It's something very familiar. I mean, the UK has it for more than 10 years now. And I think if you look at the UK example, it is um, quite useful to have such an independent advisory body. It has helped to um, keep things on track. And it's also something that we have in other policy fields. I mean, it's a bit strange that we have um, court of auditors for finance, for example, but we don't have something similar for um, for climate. Um, so these were like the three most important elements that I find in the parliament's proposal that are not being discussed um, in detail um, because they're a bit overshadowed by 2030. But I think these are really um, essential elements for governance, essential elements to take us to climate neutrality. And maybe the last one I should mention is, I mean, targets for negative emissions. And we all know that, I mean, staying below 1.5 or 2 degrees requires us to go negative actually very soon. I mean, at least to start with that, technologies and et cetera. So I think it's helpful that Parliament has already um, proposed a target for negative emissions after 2050, also incentivizing, I mean, act activities to remove carbon from the atmosphere for 2050. So these are like the four elements I would see that are really essential um, and I'm looking forward to discussing that with you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I think we've had a very good um, coverage now of uh, what's in the proposal, how far we um, are advancing. Um, it looks like towards the end of the year, we might have indeed this partial general approach agreed. Um, if I go back, if I go back to Luca, um, one thing that um, I think many people observed um, when the Green Deal was launched and the climate law proposals were launched, that one of the biggest challenges uh, would be for the, e for the Commission itself to integrate its various initiatives and powers and, and policy goals and um, come up with a coherent message. Um, because in the past, I think there were lots of silos. Somebody did environment and sustainability. Uh, DG Energy did energy. DG Agriculture did agriculture, etc. I mean, do you see that that is now going to change? I know that's a big question, but do you think there is this structure? Yeah, yeah. Won't and, and it is changing already. Like uh, we can see it. Uh, you saw it in the Green Deal on how it covers so many policy areas. Uh, you see that now every DG is trying to incorporate the Green Deal in the policy proposal. For me, where you can really see that we mean it, and when you look at the recovery package and we stick to the Green Deal as the basis for our recovery. So even in the, in the darkest time where we really need to say, okay, let's focus on the economy, let's restart it. You can see that we really put our money where our mouth was and say, we want 30% of the budget in climate and the recovery and resilience facility, this uh, 750, uh, billions extra euro that we will put in European economy to, to favorite the recovery, we say nearly 40% of it needs to go to investment in climate neutrality into new infrastructure. And so I think it is happening, not only in words, but also with, uh, with our policy proposals that we roll out, especially on the money, which is where you really see the, the extent of your commitment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, a question that I'm seeing coming coming through in the questions and answers, we'll come back to those um, in a bit, but I think there's quite a lot of um, 
interest in what does this mean for the EU's relations with its neighboring countries? Um, you did mention that um, uh, the targets um, that will be introduced will be very much um, directed at the EU and its member states. So you cannot do trade-offs uh, with third countries um, as you can now uh, in some, with some instruments. And do you see that then disappearing, that uh, it's kind of um, cooperation might be more on the diplomatic front, but uh, sort of joint investments with third countries, that's unlikely to materialize? No, of course, uh, the, the, we still want to, and we were actually going to step up our engagement with third countries on climate action and on sustainable development, development broadly. You can see that, for example, our trade agreements are more and more including uh, sustainable development. Uh, we, for example, now have a new policy of, of including the Paris Agreement as an essential element of all our external relations. And so we will start deploying this. Of course, as uh, Simone was saying, if we if we increase uh, our level of ambition in Europe, carbon pricing is going to go up. Maybe not to, to two digits, like you were saying, our studies, at least for 2030, they put a carbon price or around 45 euros uh, from now, of course. Going to climate neutrality might increase a bit. It might also decrease. Once you kicked out already a lot of emitters and you have renewable energy, then the price might also go down. And indeed, there's a role for regulation to keep driving the change rather than the, the price itself. The border carbon adjustment mechanisms, very, very controversial with our, with our friends and neighbors. Uh, of course, this is something of concern because they see it as an additional tax uh, on their exports. From our side, I think it's useful to, to, to remember that our steel producer, aluminum producer, plastics, cement, they already do pay a carbon price uh, for, uh, for their products for the, when they put them on the European market. And this is not paid by imported products. So I think that both politically and from a, a fair competition perspective, it, it's only fair that we look at also imposing this carbon price also on imported products and not just on domestic one in a full WTO compa compatible way. Of course, the efforts of their countries in addressing climate change, and in particular in having a system of carbon prices will be taken into account. Simone is saying, if you linked an ETS system, there's no risk of carbon leakage. Of course, it's the same market, it's the same price. Nobody's going to move a, a steel plant uh, from Sweden to Norway be because of the ETS, because the same ETS applies on, on both sides of the border. Uh, the difficulty is uh, when the system is uh, much more different. Uh, than that, and how will we take it into account? This is something that, that we are reflecting on. Thank you. In fact, we will come back to the whole subject of uh, mm. the carbon border tax uh, issues in, in the next seminar. That's one of the things we've highlighted for, the, for next week because it's a, a very complex topic. Um, maybe turning back then uh, to, to Simone, um, questions are also coming through about the impact um, all, all these changes on energy poverty, on, on in, especially um, for transportation um, and, and buildings that the cost should increase. Um, would you like to comment on that, Simone? Yes, um, certainly uh, that's a, a, an important topic we have to investigate more. Uh, to be honest, I don't think we have the answers yet to to give to our audience or in general, because this is somehow a, a brand new area. But we know from the past that these regressive effects I was referring to do exist. And, uh, you know, if we look at some sectors, uh, uh, think of transport, but also think of buildings, uh, like you were mentioning both, it is evident that there is this uh, discrepancy across, across classes. Uh, Take, for instance, uh, electric vehicles. The access to electric vehicles uh, is obviously very limited to the part of the population right now because it's exceedingly costly. Uh, also in terms of infrastructures, not only the, what you have to pay for a new car, also then you have to run the car and you have to create an infrastructure at home or things like this. So there are 
uh, certainly uh, different possibilities of accessing the new, uh, the, the new technologies, the cleaner technologies. And this brings me to another point, if I may enlarge a bit, which is the difference between innovation and diffusion. I think we are innovating a lot, but the diffusion of our innovation is much lower. This applies to many different sectors to which I can think of. So it's something that goes beyond the uh, social aspects, if you want, the diffusion problem that we have somehow to, to speed up across all sectors. And have you any hints as how that could be done? Uh, well, not really, but <laughs> if we look at our experience, there is a clear experience, I mean, past experience in different sectors and outside environmental context as well. There is clearly a, a break-even point. I mean, up to a point, uh, you don't get the diffusion you need to. So in the early phases, you need uh, some accompanying measures to help this diffusion. And this goes back to what I was saying before. You need also safety integration to push in the direction. Uh, so if you want the logistic curve, uh, you know, the, 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 the exponential start uh, before it flattens out, then you need uh, a little help. And uh, this kind of intervention has turned out to be important in many different sectors in the past for the diffusion of innovation. So I think we need uh, to help innovation and we are doing that pretty well, but we also need measures that help the diffusion at the later stage. And so we would need to work on both, I, I'm afraid. Thank you, oh, an important um, additional concern. Um, turning back then uh, to Jürgen, um, I don't know if you're happy to take this, this question. Uh, you, you talked quite a bit about the development of the proposals too and the agreements reached on the 23rd of October. There's quite a few questions coming through in the chat. Um, about the intermediate target for 2040. Is that um, that's, that's still, in some people's view, uh, rather open? Is that something you would also like to reflect on? Well, I think it's at the moment not the most controversial issue. I mean, the from the council side, we also want a co-decision on the 2040 targets. There are some principles now in the, in, 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 in the climate law but that's, uh, as I said, that, that's, I think the 2030 target is, is, which is discussed most controversially. And, and if, I, if I may, I would like to pick up on a, on a few issues which were just discussed by, um, by you and my predecessors. I mean, one, one thing which is really important is, is, is the question of energy poverty. I mean, if we if we extend, for instance, the emission trading system to um, to mobility and the building sector, I, what we see in the in the mobility sector, there's a willingness to pay uh, from many uh, from many market participants. That's also why some of the industries are reluctant to put the mobility into the ETS system uh, because they are willing to pay. It's a little bit different if you look at the housing sector. Uh, where, uh, where changing the heating system is linked to, to high investments. And we also have a problems of landlords and renters, which is not so easy. One way we, 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 are, we are dealing with that in Austria is that we really, um, as part of our recovery program, we dedicated really much money to, to the building sector. I mean, we have subsidies now for, for changing heating system, uh, subsidies for thermal insulation, um, it's basically 1 billion euro for, the, for 21 and 22, much more than we ever had before and much more than we will have in the, in the future. And some of the money is really earmarked for, um, uh, for, um, for poor households. We're still in discussion how to spend, uh, spend that money, but uh, to leave no one behind is really important. Um, and, and, and we don't want to have yellow vests in, in, in different countries of Europe. 
And we're also grateful for the commission for, for taking up that. I mean, we have now the just, uh, uh, just transition mechanism with the just transition fund. Unfortunately, and that was a decision by European Council, uh, we will not have as much money as we, we would have liked um, to support in particular re um, regions, which have a very long way to go in, in, in the transition from the traditional economy uh, to the um, to the low carbon uh, to the low carbon economy. I think I would leave it for that. Um, and as you as you already mentioned, you have you have um, an own discussion on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. That's also important issue for Austria. Uh, you might note that we have a relatively high share of energy intensive industry here in Austria, uh, above European average. Uh, so there is much interesting in such a mechanism, but we always we we always tell um, um, uh, there's also there's also some link to free allocation in the emission trading system and and to reduce free allocation is also something which not everyone is 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 fond of, but in 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 reality we are very eager to see the impact assessment by the Commission on on also on border mechanism. Which is uh, foreseen to be um, to be presented in the first half of, of next year. Thank you. Maybe I could ask you a question now, uh, just uh, while uh, uh, you're um, in the dialogue. There's a question that has come up in the chat on the role of nuclear energy and how that should be taken into account in these climate targets. Um, and I know Austria, of course, has recently lost a case <laughs> against the U a former member state um, on the use of nuclear, but you, we have still, I believe, several cases pending for the European Court and other member states' nuclear policies. Um, do you think that, I mean, without wanting to get into all the details of one energy source as compared to another, but is do you see a climate law um, minimizing the options, reducing the options for member states to say we want um, to get out of nuclear entirely, uh, we don't want import, imported nuclear, etc. Or you think you will be left with the same scope as before to determine your own energy mix, as the treaty says. Yeah, that that would would have been the first part of my answer. The, the choice of the energy mix. Um, I'm afraid I can't hear you, sorry. Okay, I, I, I just reiterated what you said, that the choice of energy mix is up to member states. Nevertheless, Austria has a very clear position on nuclear. Um, we, are, uh, we, 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 don't regard, we don't regard nuclear as, as safe and sustainable. Um, we also repeatedly asked the commission to come up with an impact assessment, excluding nuclear. We always got the same res uh, response from the Commission um, that uh, due to the um, free choice of the energy mix in member states, uh, that would be that would be difficult. What we see, what we see, what uh, what we see, and and that has been mentioned by uh, by many, is uh, that we really have a, a price decretion by re uh, if, if it comes to renewables, we do not see uh, shrinking prices for nuclear. Uh, I would also argue the opposite is true. It's getting more and more expensive and we are, well, it was unfortunate that they lost the case in front of the European Court of Justice concerning Hinkle Point C. Nevertheless, I mean, under normal market condition, we don't think that nuclear is too competitive. We'll also discuss that in a different circumstances. Uh, the, the commission issued end of last week, uh, the proposal for the delegated acts as part of a so-called taxonomy. A taxonomy is a very important instrument uh, to differentiate economic activities, if they are um, environment friendly, climate friendly or, or, or not. We also have here a discussion on, on, on nuclear, but we still, I mean, we see in council, there is a large fraction of countries uh, relying on nuclear. There are countries being very, um, uh, very reluctant and, and skeptical about that, but in reality, well, it's choice of a uh, choice of, of a member states where we are very clear from an Austrian perspective. We, we don't want European taxpayers money to run into nuclear. We are re really opposing to that. But we have to acknowledge reality that, as I said, uh, free choice of, of energy mix by member states. 
Thank you. In fact, the um, the recovery fund uh, will not be, uh, I believe nuclear power is not eligible for funding from that fund. That, uh, I don't know if that's now been decided, but that was certainly the, the idea to maybe keep that, that to keep out that particular con controversy. Um, can I turn back now to Niels um, to maybe just um, explore the impact of the European Parliament's um, amendments on access to justice? Is that something you think that can improve um, awareness of uh, the aims of this legislation and can maybe make it stick uh, when uh, the Commission has its hands full anyway with many um, actions and uh, supervisory tasks? Um, sure, I mean, um, I think in general terms, we have seen that um, courts have played an important role in um, advancing climate policies in many member states. Um, that is an important angle. Um, for the proposal by the European Parliament, um, that is, um, if I understand this correctly, it's only directed towards national courts. So it's nothing directed, I mean, nothing that would allow citizens or other groups to go to the European Court of Justice. So it's directed to national courts. And it's um, only um, concerning, um, con um, concerning infringement on the right to participate. Um, so Article 10 of the Aarhus Regulation. So that is what um, the, um, the European Parliament has proposed. It is nothing that would um, directly um, allow citizens or citizens or NGOs, companies, etc., to bring, um, <clears throat> for example, um, what they would consider an insufficient target or an insufficient trajectory to court. It would be only directed to um, <clears throat> to the issue of public participation. Public participation yeah. Okay. Would any uh, of the panel like to to reflect on that part? of the changes. It's a, a fairly uh, specific uh, area. Uh, Luca, yeah. Can you? Okay, uh, Luca, of course, uh, the Commission reserves the, its position because this is a, a negotiation. Uh, I'm in two minds personally, because I'm also the head of uh, litigation for, <laughs> for DG Clima. I don't like being sued, of course, like uh, not more than anybody else. Uh, but in general, uh, I think uh, access to justice is an important provision of EU law. We, you all know perfectly well that we wouldn't be where we are with the internal market if we didn't have a direct and uh, direct effect of, of European legislation and possibility for traders to, to sue. Uh, on environmental matter, I think it's also very important. I don't know for climate targets, maybe they're a little bit too abstract no, to, to become of direct and individual concern in a regulatory way uh, to affect the rights of an individual. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of weeks ago, 14th of October, no, nearly a month, uh, we also came out, the commission as a proposal to amend uh, the ARUS regulation to improve access to administrative review for NGOs and citizens. And also we have a communication in which we ask member states to do more to implement access to justice in environmental matters. Uh, and so in the broader, in this broader sense, uh, we certainly welcome the possibility to, to enforce environment legislation at, uh, at local level. Thank you. Um, and maybe sort of moving on to um, an interesting question. It's a more general question um, um, on uh, the impact of uh, the climate law and perhaps intertwined with the clean energy package and its aims um, and reflecting on the fact that um, Austria um, has a tendency to energy autonomy, that's the uh, wording uh, used by, by um, Mr. Harold Stindl. Um, do, you, do we think, given also some of the ins and outs of uh, achieving the targets of, of making sure um, industry remains competitive, um, that we can try to eliminate or at least control energy po poverty. Are we forgetting about the internal energy market? Are we allowing member states just to go their own way and um, 
promote renewables and uh, perhaps preserve this autonomy? Um, or do we think that competitiveness still depends on the good old internal market for energy? I'll start. Well, if, if, if I may start with that, I mean, um, of course, we, we, strongly, we still strongly believe internal markets. It's quite clear that solutions become cheaper if uh, the market is, 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 is bigger. There's no question about that. I mean, all the countries now depend on import of fossil fuels. We don't want to depend on import on fossil fuels, but exchange of renewable energy. Um, we still have a very ambitious target in, in expanding our renewable electricity production. We now uh, just now had, um, had uh, the, what we call the renewable expansion law in a public consultation, and we will have very soon, hopefully, a decision by government to forward um, a, a very big package uh, to our parliament um, with the ultimate goal to have 100% renewable electricity in 2030 which basically means 27 terawatt hours of additional production capacity build up in, in 10 years, which is quite a lot for Austria. As you all know, we do not have offshore wind, which is now one of the, one of the focuses. Um, but still, I mean, we want to exchange with our neighbors. Uh, that is important. Um, we have the, uh, the internal market. Uh, nevertheless, we also want to boost um, uh, local uh, production. And by the way, we see a tendency in, 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 in the energy markets also towards decentralization. Uh, we, are very, um, we are very enthusiastic about the possibility uh, which was brought by the new renewable uh, directive about local renewable energy communities. We see a lot of potential here uh, what we come from consumers to prosumers and have exchange in, in local communities. Um, so we will, we, we have, really, really interesting and, and, and fascinating uh, fascinating times. And we are really now try to provide also the, the legal framework, also some uh, sandbags for, for new innovations, um, which will fundamentally change our energy system. But as I said, we will, we're not in a position saying Austria has to do that alone. I mean, I already told you we have energy intensive industry if we had to, to, uh, to, um, to make all the supply, for instance, for hydrogen, for iron and steel production in Austria alone, that would be, well, possibly not the most cost-effective way. Thank you. Simone? Is he still there? Yeah, I, yeah I'm not here. Uh, I, just, I can just support what, what Jürgen was saying because uh, Picking up a few key concepts he was expressing, uh, it's uh, the most cost effective way can come from a coordinated uh, intervention. And, and we cannot afford to go on our own, let's say. There is still a, a great advantage in, in, in being bigger. Uh, if I can again look at another sector that I know very well is a, a emission trading system. The advantage of enlarging the market is, is clear. This comes with uh, problems that we have to face uh, and that we face at the European level now that we face if we want to extend the, the, the dimension of the market. But as Jürgen was saying, yeah, that, that is still an advantage. Uh, so we should not disperse, let's say, our policies uh, in, too much. Thank you. And Luca Niels, would you like to comment at all? Or are you uh, happy with what you've heard so far? <laughs> of course, from the European Commission, you, you already know my answer. And again, <laughs> we, are, we are doing it. We will uh, look at the Renewable Energy Directive next year. And already now in the broader energy sector, we had a smart grid, uh, grid integration strategy. So it's, uh, it's essential for us. Okay. Niels, do you think energy communities will, will take off? Communities, you mean? Um, okay. Um, energy communities, yeah. You know, local renewable energy communities. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I, mean, I think, I mean, I have I've, I've, I've really nothing to add what the previous speakers have said. Maybe one point is, and that is um, what we are seeing in the area of renewables. I mean, there is a lot of cooperation at local level. And, and I think that is um, something really worth being supported. Um, citizens and energy um, projects, I mean, these are um, very robust um, ways also to promote um, renewables. I mean, to have a buy-in from local communities that are sometimes um, affected in a negative way by renewable energy projects. And that is, I think, something very worthwhile being explored. And I think this is taking off and as renewables become cheaper and cheaper, this will, we will see this ever more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we have just time to uh, close um, with a polling question. Uh, which we'd like to put up um, for the audience uh, before I hand back to Dirk. So given um, what you've heard uh, on the ins and outs of the climate law, um, the question then to the audience, um, because the participant, uh, the panelists cannot vote, <laughs> is um, do you think that there is a need for a climate law? Uh, at EU level? Would it improve matters further? So the, the polls are now open. Ah. So it seems um, with 95%, that's a, a very large uh, degree of support. So I hope then that uh, the commission is <laughs> Lucas is, uh, grinning. Uh, he's very happy at that result. Yes. <laughs> Niels is also nodding. I can't see. Uh, hang on. I have to look to see who else is uh, still. Yes, we have got their cameras on. So everybody looks, nobody's looking as if they're disappointed in that result. So, well, I hope um, I'd like to thank uh, the panel for, for taking the audience through so many aspects of the climate law. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about the carbon um, border tax adjustment, about imports um, and the impact of, um, of these plans on third countries. So we will come back in the next session to a lot of these issues. So um, I would uh, request a bit of patience there and um, hopefully you can join us uh, next week where a lot of those issues will be uh, discussed. Um, today focus much more, I think, on the on the governance, on the ambitions, um, and uh, and then next week we'll look at some of these more detailed policy issues. So I'd like now just to hand uh, things back to Dirk, um, who has some concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lee, and thanks a lot, all panelists, for really an exciting afternoon on the European climate law. We uh, try to look at it from two perspectives. One is ambition and the other one is governance. The ambition evidently is a very political notion, the level of ambition and also um, which decades we are looking into. Um, that uh, maybe is something we need to leave to the political sphere, and we know that this decision will be taken very soon. Um, but in our forum, uh, of course, we wanted to um, explicitly focus on the governance aspect, and I think we managed uh, quite well. What we were essentially doing is reviewing a proposal by the European Commission. Thanks, Luca, uh, not only for presenting, but uh, uh, I guess also drafting it, a very balanced proposal, I must say. Um, one of the questions that maybe we could have looked even more into is the question, where did you get your inspiration from? Was that more from experiences made in other areas in European law, like the European semester? Is it uh, international agreements? Is it uh, national experience in drafting similar laws, etc.? Um, but the decisive question evidently is, uh, was and will be whether this governance scheme is good enough, is robust enough to carry us through from here to 2050. And there I believe we encountered um, a couple of uncertainties um, in the sense that 2050 is evidently far away. It is not far away in climate change terms, but it is far away in governance terms. And we also um, discussed that the pure governance, so the procedures, the institutions and their relation 
can evidently not be looked at in isolation from the law on substance. And there we already saw that um, in looking into law, it's an interesting discussion about um, an expanded ETS versus sector specific regulation um, has already and will reach a degree of complexity, um, which probably creates also um, open questions, questions at least open at this point in time on how the governance and the who does what will look like uh, for each of these sectors and then in a more comprehensive uh, manner and that is already complicated within the European institution and if we take the multi-layer uh, integration um, scheme that European Union is um, into account as well, um, it will reach really a very high level of complexity so probably um, this draft is a good example of an attempt to reduce complexity as much as we can acknowledging that things will have to develop further will have to be fine-tuned constantly and in this respect um, we have plenty of things to discuss for next year's uh, Vienna Energy Law Forum um, and among those things will of course be the up great of the clean energy package by June next year, also the ETS and there the question will be to what extent will that also upgrade uh, the governance that we will be that we were speaking about, will that be a more formal um, upgrade in terms of the renew target or will there also be new elements and uh, new features included which relate to uh, this bigger question of who does what and how do we get from where we are to where we want to be. So the um, discussion needs to remain open and it needs to remain open even, even after the climate law uh, will have been adopted uh, very soon, um, I believe. What um, we will also have to discuss, part of it we will just discuss next week, but also in the future is on how to link this European ambition and the European experience um with the international or to link it to the international level um we here in the energy community um have um taken notice uh, of course with a lot of enthusiasm by the leaders of the western balkan six countries who have already endorsed the european climate law uh, before its actual adoption in the European Union. So it seems that for this um, piece of legislation, there is uh, great, not only great expectations, but also great enthusiasm in Europe's neighborhood. And I'm sure um, that the um, linkage of the decarbonization efforts in Europe um, with other countries will go beyond our immediate neighborhood and will also shape the discussion for years, if not decades to come. And with this, I would like to thank you once again, all uh, Lee um, for this uh, very skilled moderation and bringing in uh, a lot of good questions, not only from the audience, but also um, by you and ourselves and evidently for the uh, panelists, uh, which really have us have given us uh, a very comprehensive um, perspective, which resulted now in a, in a very clear and obvious uh, polling and voting uh, of 95% in favor of a climate law. So looks like you have all been doing um, a, a great job, lawyers, um, the politicians, if I may say so, Jürgen, uh, and also the economists and uh, the audience uh, got convinced. Um, well pitched and now we just need to see um, how it's going to be implemented and adopted good luck to all of that and see you uh, to all of you in that and see you all um, next week at the same time when we will dive deeper into the question of carbon pricing have a nice afternoon thank you very much thank you thanks a lot